Well, good morning, Southside Bible. Special welcome to our guests. We're grateful to have you here with us this morning to worship our God together. I have two special guests I wanted to introduce. I've got my daughter Kayla in town and my four-month-old grandson in utero with her. So, hallelujah. Yeah. I'm a happy grandpa. Well, at the close of our time in the Word this morning, as Brian mentioned, we'll be partaking of the Lord's table together. We're going to remember the sacrificial death uh, on our behalf of our Savior to bring us to forgiveness of sins before our God. Also, this morning, we're going to be finishing up Romans chapter 9. If you will turn there, I know some of you are very happy about this. Um, Others have shared how this has changed your life, so we're just kind of having a lot of joy together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, For me, God has done a sweet work in my heart. I feel such a deep gratitude and a profound humility that makes me just want to sing the doxology all day long for this faithful God who has been merciful to me. Uh, This is the conclusion to Paul's teaching in Romans 9. Um, It's what some of you have been kind of saying, I I need this, I, I want this, I've been waiting for this. This is kind of the other side of the coin of what we have been studying. Uh, the, the part that is may, maybe cooking some of your grits is you, you can see throughout Scripture that man is responsible. They're called to repent and believe. The Scriptures are filled with it. And, and Romans 9 just feels so sovereign-ish. Is that a word? It just, you, you've just been saying, that, that, where's the other part to the, what I read in my Bible? And this morning, Paul will give us another perspective on why so many in Israel have rejected the Messiah who came into the world. And we've just looked at the sovereign reason all the way through chapter 9 so far. And today we're going to look at the human responsibility reason, or I'm going to call it the human irresponsibility of Israel. And this answer is that God did not fail. Israel failed. They failed to believe the promises of God and what He had been telling them through history. And so what we see is that that these two truths are are not mutually exclusive, but married. Paul has been showing us divine sovereignty and God's choosing and election. And this morning, he'll show us the human responsibility of man. They're they're not warring against each other. They're friends. They're compatible truth. And Paul says them both. He doesn't flinch in showing us both sides of this coin. Therefore, Who is responsible for Israel's current state, which started this whole chapter, their unbelief in Messiah? Can can God hold uh, Gentiles as well who believe in Christ and bring them to the end? Well, in verses 6 through 29, God ultimately is the reason. And now in verses 30 through 33, Israel personally is the reason. And so we'll see the importance of the human decision about Jesus Christ. That faith is a a determination, it's a a commitment, it's a trusting yourself to the promises of God, it's a surrender, it's a relying upon the work of Jesus Christ. Faith is that. Human volition is necessary to be saved throughout the Bible. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Receive Him, come to Him, and you'll find rest. God never does an end around your faith, He just creates it. So you must believe and trust in Jesus Christ, and Paul will move from one to the other without apology, nor do I. And so in our text, Paul will lay Israel's condition upon Israel, and I'd like to take that up this morning with, to me, this is the the climax of 30 years of my life of studying Scripture is the verses we're going to look at. So I'm a little giddy. Uh, I've been asking the Lord to keep me under control. What we're going to look at is an all-you-can-eat buffet. So let's pray to God and ask Him to feed us with the Word of God this morning. Father, we come before You and we have just hit pure gold this morning. I find this to be the summary of Romans. And I ask, Lord, that uh, every believer in here would have their conscience so fully persuaded from the Word of God and the Spirit that Christ Jesus has accomplished our salvation. That this very moment we stand in your presence fully righteous, fully justified, and fully accepted by our God. 
That is the most sanctifying truth there is. And so God, do that in every heart here this morning. I pray for those who are not believing and are laboring under the law to get acceptance, trying to clean themselves up so God could like them. Oh, Father, this morning, let it be the end of their plight. Let it be the end of such misery. Let them find rest and peace with their Creator. God, I pray, meet us here and do my, more than any human being could, could ever do, more than we could hope or think, and that the glory of God would be on display. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, our outline, this is the last time you got to hear it. I said that last week, but I, I gotta, I, I gotta, you got to tie this together. Um, in verse 6, we saw an accusation as, as the Word of God failed uh, because Israel, so many are unbelieving, and God chose them as the covenant nation. Has it failed? And the answer is no. He gives us an axiomatic truth. Then our second point, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. You don't get children by natural birth. You get it by supernatural birth. And then he began his argument, the third point, uh, by looking at God chose Isaac and not Ishmael. God chose Jacob and not Esau in the womb before they had done anything good or bad so that God's election, his choice, might stand in verse 11. And then we took on the antagonist. That's not fair. How can God still find fault for who can resist his will? If you are, have not been here and would like the answers to that, I encourage you to go hear those in our past sermons. Uh, then the answer we looked at last week in verses 24 to 29 uh, it is not as though the Word of God has failed. God has declared that He has always been drawing out a remnant from Israel who, who would believe and be saved, and that Gentiles would be brought into this promise that was made to Abraham that Brian read in Galatians 3. That Galatians 3 just summarized, I think, this whole section on Romans perfectly to, to go home and maybe read that and pray on your own. Well, this morning, our sixth point, then, is we're going to look at the conclusion. Let me read it for you. What shall we say, then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will in no way ever be disappointed. And so as we begin this morning, Paul gives two reasons why anyone could get saved. And the only way you'll ever be saved in the first, uh, all of Romans 9, is if God has chosen you, if God has chosen to put mercy upon you to give you that gift that the freeness of God gives. There's no other way to be saved. And then secondly, you must attain to righteousness by faith. You, you have to become perfectly righteous to be in the presence of God. So you must be chosen and you must be clothed in a righteousness to ever be saved. And that's a summary of chapter 9. And this is so good because he chooses us, but God cannot just choose us and say, now you're saved. Come enjoy my presence. Come live in my, my, my presence for the rest of your days. Unrighteousness cannot dwell on the presence of God. That's a foundation of, his, his, of his, the whole Bible and his attributes. God's perfect holiness hates unrighteousness. They'll never have koinonia. They'll never have fellowship together. Sin and imperfection cannot dwell in God's presence. If you hope to dwell in the presence of God with sin, it will never happen. The whole Bible declares that to be true. Get this, that only perfect righteousness then can be in God's presence. There's no other way. Perfect righteousness and God are the only two things that can marry and spend eternity together. And what was the first three chapters of Romans? Romans 3, 9, he concludes after all the, the showing that we're all under sin, both Jew and Gentile, he said, are under the dominion of sin. And then he says, no, there's none righteous, not even one. 
We're all born Jew or Gentile. The nations are Jewish people. We come into this world with, with original sin and depraved natures and self as a center reference point, and we are under the dominion of sin. It's a big problem. <laughs> That's hyperbole. How can unrighteous people dwell in the presence of one who can only abide with perfect, beautiful righteousness? That is the million-dollar question. The kind that only the Trinity has been able to dwell uh, for all of eternity in perfect righteousness, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How can we come into the Trinity and enjoy their fellowship? I need that kind of righteousness to be in fellowship with them. I need a perfect righteousness like theirs to come into this beautiful fellowship of Trinitarian love. So then, election can save no one. Some of you have, uh, some of you just have that doctrine nailed. I, I'm intimidated by how well you have it nailed backwards and forwards. Uh, you know every argument, you have an answer for everything. And you have every verse memorized to defend it. And I say, hallelujah. Uh, you even have dreams of tiptoeing through tulips at night. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, guys. But I want you to hear this this morning. It's very important. Write this in your election notes. I have some highlighters I'll give out later. I'd like you to highlight it even. Election alone can save no one. Understanding election, get this saves nobody. Being a master theologian on election cannot save you. And some of you just need to know that this morning. To stand in the presence of God with great joy and blameless, you must have a perfect righteousness. Remember Romans 1.17, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to bring salvation. For in this gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed. And remember, it was a genitive that said the God kind of righteousness is revealed in the gospel. The righteousness that God requires to be in his presence is the kind of righteousness that's revealed in this gospel. Hallelujah! Some of you look sleepy, like the righteousness that God wants is in this gospel. Our passage this morning says you must attain to the righteousness of God. So then we need a gospel that in it, the righteousness of God can be revealed. And what tripped up the Jews in our passage is that a law of righteousness from Moses, God gave it to Moses, was given to them. And they were to keep it. And they were, if they disobey, they die. And they lived under this for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands. And so they, they took that law and they pursued it with a zeal and with a vigor to attain to righteousness. I'm going I'm to get there. I'm going to keep this law, and I will become righteous. In fact, just flip back to Romans 3. This review is worth it. <clears throat> flip back to Romans 3, verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, this is the Mosaic law, it speaks to those who are under the law. Purpose so that every mouth may be closed and all the world might become accountable to God. It's to shut you up to your own righteousness. It was to close your mouth instead of opening it. In verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will ever be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. My favorite two words, but now, apart from the law, Mosaic law, the God kind of righteousness has been manifested. And it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets were telling us about this kind of righteousness that would come into the world. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. I don't know how you can say it any clearer. So by way of inter introduction, Unconditional election by itself saves no one. It will bring you into it, but it can't save you. We must attain to a God kind of righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. By 
what God has joined together, election brings you into that chain of grace that we saw in Romans 8. And it will bring you to faith and it will bring you to glorification. And so what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Uh, election, faith, salvation, it's all joined together by God. And that's what we'll take up this morning. And, I, and this is just pure gold. My prayer all week is that everyone in this room would attain to the righteousness of God this morning, that no one would walk out and look to their own doings for their acceptance with God. Here's what Paul has been laboring for for three years. Come join me in eating the fruit this morning. So let's take it up. Here's your outline. Romans 9, 30 through 33. and verses 30 through 31, Paul just gives you the facts. And then in verse 32, he gives us an explanation. And then in verse 33, the scriptural support from the Old Testament that this is how God has always planned it. So start with the facts. Verse 30. What should we say then? Paul has used that in 4 This is his way of saying, okay, let, let's look at what I've been saying. What, what do we say to these truths? And Paul's using this phrase now to, to drive in the nail of his final argument. And what Paul is after this time is, what should we say then? The Gentiles. The Gentiles, they didn't pursue righteousness, but they arrived at it. And the Jew who went hard after righteousness did not attain it. This is so disturbing to the history of the Jewish person and to the moral person sitting here this morning. This is just opposite stuff. I, I just, this illustration probably isn't going to do much, but I'm going to try it. I want you to picture you're, you're coming to uh, an Olympic 100-yard dash, and there's two people who are running it. The first person walks up. You have trained your whole life for this run, you have a genealogy of Olympic runners for four generations in your family. You've been taught since you were a little kid. You've trained your diet. You know the course in your sleep. You're a machine. And the second runner comes up, and he has no clue. He's never trained a day in his life. Reminds me of me. Slothful, overeating, shows up in jeans and cowboy boots and skull in the back of his pocket. <laughs> And, and you're just like, I know who's going to win this race. And the Jews saying that, we're, we're going to win this race. And the gun goes off, and you're flying down the course, and you leave the other runner in the dust, and you look back, and he's not even running. He's over at the vending machine getting soda pop and candy. And you get to the end of the race, and that guy's sitting there, and his kickers at the banquet table with a medal on and a soda pop in his hand. Guys, that's what's before us this morning. The Jews were so strict and labored hard under the law for righteousness. They trained and prepared for it day and night. They labored and memorized Torah and, and sought righteousness. God was the center of this nation and all that they did. Their history is God. And, and now these pagan Gentiles who are outside the promises, the dogs, the uncircumcised Philistines, they're, they're getting the prize. It says the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, they were strangers to God's covenants of promise and to righteousness. They, they didn't even care about Torah, keeping it to be righteous before God. Justification was not the issue of their heart. Romans 1 says there was a creation, and the Gentiles, they knew there was a God. His invisible attributes were clearly seen, and they suppressed the truth and said, I don't want a God like that. We're, we're, we don't want him in our mind and in our thinking, and we get rid of him. Righteousness is not what burned in their hearts, but in Romans 1.24, lust and burning after one another and sin is what burned in their hearts. And he said they gave hearty approval to everybody who disobeyed and sinned with them. They loved it. They rejoiced in iniquity together, just a, a picture of our world. And they're just proud of their immorality. They laugh at God. They enjoyed their sin. They gave little thought to heaven or hell. The Gentiles were more concerned, Jesus said, about what to eat and drink and wear than about righteousness. And so here's the amazing part of our passage. Those ones attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. 
the ones who are living in heinous sin, they're shaking their fists at God and defying Him, the ones who said, I'd rather worship a singer, a movie star, a friend, nature, instead of God, are the ones who attained righteousness. This just exalts the mercy of God all the more. The ones who sought Him not attained it because He sought them when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. And as we look at church history, especially the book of Acts, what we see is churches springing up all over the place as Paul is preaching. And he goes into cities and he goes into the synagogues first and he preaches the way of righteousness that we are looking at this morning. And the Jews reject him, they throw him out, they persecute him, they try to destroy his message and they try to kill him. And then he goes to the Gentiles and he preaches the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. The need of righteousness so they can be saved from the wrath of God that is to come. And God opens their eyes to their true state. And we hear statements like, what must I do to be saved? I need righteousness. And towns are being changed. And in Ephesus, there's a great riot over the gospel because the idol makers are going out of business. And we just stand in awe of no matter how debauched or sinful, or how deep, or how opposed to God, coming to the fountain of Jesus Christ, you can be washed, renewed, changed, and made right with God. And so they hear Paul's message, and they go, I'm a perfect fit for this gospel. I'm a sinner. I deserve the judgment of God, and I have no righteousness to offer God. That wasn't hard for them to agree with. I have no righteousness. And they fall on Christ, and they're getting saved the woman washing the feet, and all those Pharisees going, he's not a prophet or he would know what kind of woman is touching him. And he, he said that that great sinner went away justified because she looked to Jesus for righteousness. The message for those who have not uh, been religious your whole life, and you've walked in here and you have a life of sin and debauchery and drugs or evil, you've had the heartbreak of broken marriage and the pain that goes with it. Being right with God and trying to please Him has been suppressed your whole life. The one who has absolutely no hope in your own righteousness this morning, I want you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gives the righteousness that you need instead of you having to go do it. It's the best message that could ever be. And then the message to you who have been religious your whole life you can attain to the righteousness of God because in all you're doing and all you're working, you can never get acceptance with God by your righteousness. And so this is the gospel for sinners, for Jew and Gentile, for religious or irreligious. This gospel's for all. Second point, the Jews in verse 31. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. And that's one of the saddest things to me in the Bible. It says Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. Israel was pursuing after a righteousness that was given in Mosaic law. And they, they, were, they were concerned about God. They were concerned about judgment. They were concerned about righteousness. Um, they, they were religious. They were surrounded by it. And they were seeking to keep the laws, and some memorized the entire Torah and offered sacrifices and kept the feasts and the holy days. They were doing it all, and in Romans 10 too, they had a zeal for God. They, they, were, they went after this hard. They wanted the righteousness. And so those who were wrapped in all of that privilege that we've been studying in Romans and were so close, they strove to obey the law, but the, the Word of God here says they did not arrive at that law the, the Greek words obtain. They, they never arrived at the righteousness that that law requires or pointed to. The demands were too high. They were too impossible for anyone born of Adam to reach. They fooled themselves that they were doing it, and that's the hypocritical way. You're faking it. I am attaining to righteousness. I am a good person. I'm keeping the law, and you're, just, you're, you're faking it, and that's what the Pharisees are doing. And it just fills our land this morning. We're filled with people pretending 
and people performing, trying to do enough to get God's acceptance. So here's what, is, what we have. Those who were not pursuing righteousness got it. And those who were pursuing it didn't get it. They missed it. In fact, when the very one who came to give them righteousness, they hated him, they hated his message, they hated his light, and they killed him. <clears throat> Paul said in Philippians 3, I was under that law trying to keep it, and, and I, I was so zealous, I was above all everyone else and going after righteousness, but the things that I thought were gain, and what he means gain is that they were making me right with God. He says they actually are loss. And so it wasn't even a zero. It was leading them away from God. And so I just want you to hear that. If you're here this morning trying to be religious and clean yourself up and be good, it's actually leading you away from God, not to him. And so the question that comes to our mind is why? Why did Israel fail? Why did they do this? How did they miss it? And that's our, our second point, the explanation in verse 32. Why? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as though it were by works. Paul gives two ways that Israel failed. They, the, they rejected faith and went after righteousness by works. The second way, they refused to acknowledge Christ as the object of faith that would bring salvation. So they rejected two things. It's by faith and the object that you must have faith in, Jesus Christ. And so they had such a focus on the pursuit of the law that they missed the man, Christ Jesus, who, who came and fulfilled it. They, and it still plays out in our day. So many miss Christ in our churches. And I know there's some in here this morning that you're missing Christ by your going to church. A prayer is that no one would miss this. So let's look at it. Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. The problem is how the Jews pursued after righteousness. The law came through Moses. The law had a lot of different functions. It revealed the character of God, but it was not a chin-up bar um, to get yourself right with God, but it was to be a tutor to lead you to Jesus Christ so you would find true righteousness. As in Matthew 5, Do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill and so as you look at Israel, they had the, the atonement and the blood and the death of the lambs and all of that. And the unsaved Israelites, uh, they, they looked at the ceremonial law as part of their righteousness, and they missed that it was a, a type with an anti-type being Jesus Christ, that he would come and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And so they, they looked at law. Uh, they looked at the righteousness that was required in the law, and they sought to keep it to be accepted by God. And that was 21 years of my life history, just trying to keep the law to be a good guy, to be right with God. So the law could only reveal righteousness, and Romans 8, 3 said it, it couldn't give it. It couldn't get rid of your guilt before God. It couldn't give you a new heart that loved God. The law could just say, do this and live. It can't change hearts. It can't change your standing with God, as weak as it was in Romans 8, 3. <laughs> It couldn't pay the debt for our sin and, and give me new hearts. So the law could not make us righteous. It was not a code for us to follow to arrive at righteousness, but rather it was to show us as a mirror our lack of righteousness and flee to the one that was being foreshadowed in it. So the righteousness that God demands, he gives to us in Jesus Christ. And it comes by grace, freely, through the instrument of faith and not by works. You don't do something to get this righteousness. You fall on Christ and you receive His by the grace of God. And the Jews stumbled and they missed righteousness because they thought it came by what they could do. They would not give up their carnal confidence that they could keep that law. And because of our fallen nature, you cannot keep this law. The standard is God. There can be no defect, no shortcomings, not one sin. It's a scale theology is, is never going to work. God doesn't grade on a curve. He demands perfection. And law-keeping is a false hope for eternal life. 
I do this, I do that, I've, I've never killed anyone, I've never murdered, you know, all those things. I do that, that isn't it. You're going to die and stand before a holy God and see what perfect righteousness really looks like, and anyone who saw it falls dead. And your works and all your good stuff, that little righteousness is going to become a filthy rag as you look into the holiness of God. And all these things that you built your life on, you're going to be like, oh, no. Oh, no. And you'll see that there's only one kind of righteousness that can ever make you acceptable to God. And you know what it is? Perfect righteousness. It is God looking at the mirror kind of righteousness and seeing himself. Christ Jesus can allow you to stand in the midst of that holy, consuming fire, blameless with great joy, and it only comes by faith, who see their complete unrighteousness and look to Christ for his alone. And then secondly, then they stumbled, he said, over the stumbling stone. They rejected and they refused to surrender to the very means that God had designed for righteousness to come by the Lord Jesus Christ. They were so focused on personal effort and law-keeping that they stumbled over the stone that God set before them. The stone was Jesus Christ. Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. People stumble over him daily. We still try to look to our own righteousness you can, you, you, know, you can have a cross that you wear every day. You get up and you see it in the mirror. You can have a big old tattoo on your back of a cross and still spend daily trying to establish your own righteousness. I watch it on a daily basis. I've always told you about that kid that I, I went and taught at CU um, in, a, in one of their uh, fraternities. And there was this one guy who was uh, as zealous as I've ever met. And finally, he just rips open his shirt and on his chest is tattooed the Great Commission in Greek. <laughs> you imagine? I'm a coward. I, I, I like it. I think I would like to put it on me. But what he told me is he spent his whole life just preaching the gospel to anyone who would listen. And if anyone walked by him on that campus and he didn't preach the gospel, he knelt down and repented and asked God's forgiveness. And he was the most zealous young man I ever met. And then he got saved. And he finally realized that I was trying to attain God's favor by fulfilling the Great Commission and preaching the gospel, and I was living under law. And when grace finally broke in, he said, I want to get up every morning now and remember the gospel of grace to go spread it to the nations. Now I do it because I am accepted. I sat at a baseball game, the Colorado Rockies. That was painful enough. <laughs> And a dear friend of mine that I grew up with since kindergarten, um, it was a bachelor party, and he and I began talking, and he said, Murph, he said, do you mean to tell me that Ted Bundy could repent at the end of his life and be forgiven for everything that he did, and a guy as good as me, I'm just a good guy, could die and go to hell? I said, exactly. And we dug into the gospel. And at the end, he just said, that's foolishness. And a year ago, he dropped dead at 55 of a heart attack. People are still stumbling over Jesus Christ. And they're still trying their own righteousness. Every cult is a way to establish your righteousness. And it needs to break our hearts. And what, what was prayed for this morning for the missions in my neighborhood and everywhere, I need to take this gospel. So many people trying to establish their own righteousness, and I have the best answer. The righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to ask you, are you sitting here this morning still stumbling over him? Trying to be a good person, going to church, trying to change and grow so that God will accept you on your last day. I'm asking you this morning to die to your own righteousness. This gospel says that in this gospel, a God kind of righteousness is revealed. And in Jesus Christ, 
His righteousness will be put to your account as if you lived the life Jesus lived. It's the only way you can spend eternity in the presence of perfect holiness is clothed in his own with that wedding garment of his perfect righteousness wrapped around you. Jesus stood in front of a crowd and said, unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Unless you have something better than your own hard works and your own religious efforts, you won't enter the kingdom of God. And then he drives the stake a little deeper in case you miss it. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The only way to be that is the one who said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's only one who's as perfect as the Heavenly Father. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that righteousness can be put to your account. By faith. Just an empty hand. Not your doing, not your efforts, not your cleaning up. The first failure of the Jew is we can do it. And the second is they missed the man who could and they stumbled over Jesus Christ. Christ is the goal of the law. For the Jew, their own righteousness was the goal of the law. May no one in my hearing make the same mistake this morning. Southside, learn from Israel's mistake. Let no one in this room make the same mistake. Little children, I love you, don't make the same mistake. Don't say my parents are just Christians and, and therefore I'm, I'm in, I'm safe. Little, little four-year-olds need to be saved. There's a righteousness that God offers to four-year-olds and 90-year-olds this morning. Don't make the same mistake. Look to Jesus Christ. And I'll close out. He does the scriptural support in verse 33. He quotes Isaiah 8, 14 and 28, 16, and he kind of meshes them. And he says, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. To be told your righteousness is a filthy rag, and that's what I'm telling you, and you can do nothing to make yourself right with God, that's what I'm telling you, is an offense to the unsaved mind, to the moralistic person. You mean to tell me as good as I've been my whole life, it does nothing? No, it, do, it does less than nothing. It leads you away from God. It's not just zero, it's negative. Christ having to die on a cross for your sin because you're so bad, me, had to die on a cross for my sin is an offense. It's an offense to moralistic teaching. The death of Christ is a stumbling block. 1 Corinthians 1, the Jews ask for signs, the Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, it's a stumbling block. And to Gentiles, it's moronic. But to those who are the called of God, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God for our salvation. Commentator Robert Haldane said, A free salvation becomes an offense to men on account of their pride. They cannot bear the idea of being indebted for it to a sovereign grace, which implies that in themselves they're guilty and ruined by sin. They desire to do something, were it ever so little, to merit salvation, at least in part. I just want to add something to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And my favorite statement in this passage is, he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And I tell you with great boldness, the one who entrusts himself to Christ and believes in him will never be disappointed. Ever. I hope you grasp the fullness this morning of what this means. The one who loses his life in this world for Christ will never be disappointed. When you stand before a holy, awesome God and see him as he really is, you're not going to be disappointed. You will if you stand in your little flimsy righteousness. <laughs> and then understand how much sin, you'll, you'll, just, you'll realize how offensive sin is to God when you see him. And you're going to stand there with the knowledge of all of your sin. And you're going to look down at the garment that he clothed you at when you believed. And you're going to see the perfect righteousness of Christ wrapped around you, and God's going to say, well done, 
good and faithful servant, receive your eternal salvation, enter into my eternal joy, you will not be disappointed. Aren't you tired of being disappointed in your life? 90% of my counseling is people who are disappointed. I'm disappointed. So many things. But this is going to end with one big victory. To never have disappointment for all of eternity. The difficulties of walking the opposite way of a world. Mocking you, hating you, ridiculing you. The battle against sin and the enemy is endless. I've had so many sleepless nights. The battle to fight the good fight of faith, to rest in what I'm preaching this morning. The reality of remaining sin. Walking in the spirit and not the flesh. Weak bodies can bring depression and anxiety. I just want you to hear When you stand before God, you will not be disappointed. Let that give strength to your walk this morning. I wish I could have one conversation with Paul. Do you think he's disappointed? I do laid it out for the kingdom, and I guarantee you he's not disappointed. And so, brethren, this precious stone has been set. And this stone is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he came and he perfectly obeyed righteousness. He's the perfect son of God, spirit-filled man who gave righteousness. And he became a sin offering for us on a cross And God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up. What a precious stone that God has given to us. And I believe this is the most significant truth for us in the Bible. In Revelation 20 and 21, as this Bible ends, we see there's going to be a new heaven and where righteousness dwells. And the gates always open because we're safe. And then then there's this eternal lake of fire where the worm's never going to die and the fires burn forever and the torment just rises up. That's how this is all going to end. And you can put your fingers in your ears and say, ooh, I can't hear you, but this is how God's going to end history. And the ones who are going to make up hell stumbled over the stumbling stone. And he was a rock of offense. And the ones who receive this righteousness by faith are going to enter eternal life and dwell in the new heavens and the new earth. What you do with Jesus Christ will affect your eternity. I pray that weighs on our hearts this morning. And the ones who believe in him by faith and not by works, you will not be disappointed. The last day, you won't be disappointed. And we get that last day declaration when we stand before God right now. When we believed, it's put to our account, and God says, not guilty. Right now, this morning, you're not guilty. You're righteous before God. The way I woke up this morning, ah, it's a foretaste of my judgment day. I woke up this morning not guilty. Not guilty, and I have lived a guilty life. And this gospel, I'm just... Not guilty, and when I stand before the holy, awesome, majestic God who knows all things, not guilty. So what I have this morning, I'm going to have in eternity. So good. So let's close out. Do you see why I'm so excited? Almost three years now in Romans. My conclusion, as the hymn writer said, are you ready to lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet, and stand in him and him alone gloriously complete. Are you you done trying to muster up your righteousness to get God's acceptance? Lay it down. Stand in Christ by faith, gloriously complete. Have you been convinced by God's word? Have you been convinced by his death and resurrection from the dead and his ascension? Have you been convinced by your labors 
Are you weary and heavy laden trying to get God to smile at you? Are you convinced you won't be disappointed on that last day? Are you convinced? Come to Jesus and he'll give you rest for your weary soul this morning. We began Romans and I prayed for a revival and many in this church prayed for the same thing. And today may hundreds attain to the righteousness that God has given in Christ and that we would be awakened to what a gift this gospel is and that it would revive our soul in regards to how great a salvation God has given us and the glory of God that we saw in Romans 9, this free gift to show mercy upon whom he desires. May we just be overtaken and may the world be changed by this band of redeemed children at Southside Bible Church. Amen? Come to Jesus. If you never have, you won't be disappointed. He's able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how clear and sweet and beautiful Paul summed up this section. And God, I pray for none in this room to walk out of here still looking at their own hands, going, look what I can do. He doesn't know how good I am. He, he doesn't get how hard I've worked and I feed the poor and I, I do all these things. God, I pray, let it die this morning. Let them sit in their seat realizing they, what they hold to is a filthy rag before God. God, I pray, let them call upon Jesus for his death, for their sin, and his life for their righteousness. God, let them believe the gospel. And I pray for the saints of God, let our hearts just be so blessed and encouraged with this kind of a gift. We have the gift of righteousness. God, take my life, my heart, my soul, my all, and let us serve the King of kings, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.